Cities are home to three billion people, and another three billion are looking to join them over the next 40 years. If city lights resemble a gigantic network of neurons, a challenge of a similar magnitude is opening up. How can we produce the energy required when resources are running out and citizens always have good reasons for turning on the light? What has become clear in the last 10 years or so is that this second industrial revolution is now sunsetting. Fossil fuel energies are getting more and more expensive. We can't get much more productivity out of them. We really reach the maximum uh, potential. In 2003, the massive power cut experienced in New York gave a glimpse of life in a megalopolis after the lights have been switched off. Once the excitement of participating in a super blackout party on a city scale has passed, the anxiety creeps in over having experienced a foretaste of a scenario that is no longer very futuristic, a return to the Stone Age amongst the dizzying tower blocks of an extinct civilization. Fortunately, there are glimmers of hope in these dark scenarios, like Jeremy Rifkin. An economist and designer of futuristic plans for saving humanity, Rifkin has found a solution, revolution, an industrial revolution, and the third revolution to bear that name. What became apparent to me in the 1990s was that we are on the cusp of a new convergence of communication energy, a third industrial revolution. All the great economic revolutions in history occur when new energy regimes emerge. New energy regimes make possible more complex societies that increase energy flow, allows us to bring more people together, differentiate their labor skills, integrate them into larger economic organisms, and expand our economic potential across time and space. Thus, with the invention of the steam engine and the mining of coal to fuel it, the cities of the first industrial revolution sprang up along the railways and the workers' houses were clustered around factories so the people could walk to work. The second industrial revolution emerged with oil and the combustion engine. Populations were then able to spread out thanks to the motor car, and life in the suburbs became a reality, linked by electricity grids and telephone cables. This whole world relies on fossil fuels. Our power, transport, heat, and light, it's all made out of fossil fuels. So in a sense, we have dug up the burial grounds of the Carboniferous Age, and we've transformed all that carbon, coal, oil, and gas, into the accoutrements, the goods, the services, the infrastructure for a great civilization. We built a great short-lived civilization, but almost destroyed the biosphere for this planet with runaway climate change. But according to Rifkin, after coal and gas, the future of civilization will depend on the wind and sun. And in his dream city, all the buildings will be converted into miniature green power stations that will turn wind and sun into electricity. They'll be capable of storing this energy for rainy days or weeks when there is no wind. And all these interconnected mini power stations will create a shared network, an energy community from which everyone can take what they need or donate their surplus. This is the energy internet that we will obviously explore in electric cars. We're actually using off-the-shelf internet technology and transforming the electricity grid to an energy internet, a distributed smart grid that actually acts exactly like the internet. Jeremy Rifkin is no amateur when it comes to developing economic plans. He's written thousands of pages that have been translated into a host of languages and uses the contacts this has brought him with a skilled hand. Heads of state and influential businessmen and women pay for his advice in terms of imagining the future. But his seductive energy model is still facing a few political and technological challenges. And Rifkin continues to travel the world to convince people that the revolution truly is underway. On the other side of the Atlantic, in the north of France, the mining landscape bears witness to a source of energy that is now exhausted.
For us, coal meant work. But in addition to that, it meant men who were dying aged 45 to 50 from silicosis. It meant pollution right across the region. We don't deny that history. But that history is over now. It had some very negative impacts, and today, we know that what we have lived here on a local level is the same as what the planet is experiencing on a global scale. In La Sangoelle, after the last pits closed in the 1980s, the ecologist mayor, Jean-Francois Caron, decided to produce the town's energy from a virtually inexhaustible source, the sun. The huge power station supplies the energy for around 30 homes, and even the church, which is converted to green power, transforming celestial light into electrons. Insulating the buildings and building environmentally friendly neighborhoods has reduced the energy bill by 35%. In this impoverished commune, the green argument is also an economic one. Between someone who spends 2,000 euros on electricity and who is cold in their house, and someone who pays less than 200, there's no point in giving people a whole spiel about ideology and sustainability. It's just practical. It's better than a pay rise. On the face of it, even in the north of France, taking a gamble on the sun to produce energy has to be worth it because it's free. Especially as the town's various green installations were financed through grants. But Jean-Francois Caron wants to prove that this new energy model isn't just viable for a commune with 7,000 inhabitants, but also on a regional scale. The challenge right now for us is changing the scale. France spends 70 billion euros every year on energy, whether it's gas, oil, coal, or uranium. And that goes abroad, to emirs or Russians. Imagine if we could take that money and put it into insulating every building in France. But how can you convince an entire region to throw itself into the third industrial revolution? The spiritual father of energy transition hasn't only come to the Nord Pas de Calais region to visit the church of La Sangoelle. The regional council has called upon him to design a complete overhaul of the region's energy system. And after a year on the case, Jeremy Rifkin is ready to reveal his roadmap. Jeremy Rifkin has a considerable role. In a way, he's like a catalyst. In this region, there are a certain number of forces, a certain number of initiatives. And if we want this to be strong, it needs to be coherent. This is it a master plan for a third industrial revolution build out in this beautiful region of northern France. Well, in this region... Rifkin's plan is to make the Nord Pas de Calais region a world example on a big scale of a new energy model. But is his energy internet a realistic prospect? This was a 